One of my arguments is um, why this idea of a revolutionary spirit? Yep. Uh, Pakun himself has said that he was very, very uh, respectful of the, of the works of the revolutionary writers, and I, this is the one where I can go on and on and on forever, uh, about the revolutionary writers. Uh, and of course, the greatest of them all is Lu Sun, um, who is the, indeed the, the, the foremost writer of modern China. Uh, he's the editor of the New Youth magazine, which is very important. New Youth was a major platform for inciting revolution in, uh, this is 1919, eh? so this was after the First World War, not the Second World War, so in between. Uh, and he was the nominal leader of the Left Wing Writers League. Left Wing Writers League, so he, so he was uh, idolized, made into an icon by the Communist Party, though he himself never, never really uh, joined the Left Wing Writers League but he was the nominal head of the, of the, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Now, I suggest that Pao Kun was greatly influenced by the revolutionary writers uh, of China. Revolutionary, in 1911, uh, the Qing dynasty, you know, the Manchu dynasty, the last dynasty was brought down. Now, that was the end of like f at least 4,000 solid years of imperial rule. Then, so the Qing, 1911, and who knocked Qing on the head? Among them is a guy called Yuan Shikai, is it? Yuan Shikai, yeah. He was the, considered a minister of defense, lah. So he doomed them, and then he became the first president of the republic, I think 1912. Short while later, he made himself emperor, Bali again. But there was good reasons, because, you know, they, he felt that you can't control the masses. Now, the the Chinese is ruled by a very, very small group of people. And the masses and masses of peasants, the unwashed rebel. So a small group of miserable people who can't fight to save their lives were ruling a whole bunch of wild people. You know, I'm Hokkien and we are the most fierce uh, people. Hmm. So, uh, so this was around the time, 1911. So revolution began then. So I've got here the six laws of Chinese painting by this fellow called Xie He. And, and he's, I mean, that was a mighty long time ago, but he's still very, very well regarded. And I chose that, to, but you must understand, this idea runs across uh, Chinese art. The, on the sixth law, they say, follow your, the predecessors. So this is how the Chinese actually have their creativity, they riff. So if you see Patan Ren, you can find a whole lot of Patan Shan Ren like paintings that follow after him. Because you take the painting and then you change that style with a little bit. So I felt that uh, uh, Pao Kun used a lot of the revolutionary writers, particularly Lu Sun, and he riffed on that. Now Lu Sun wrote in the Fan de Sikil, I hope I pronounced it right. It's not Fin de Sikil, Fan de Sikil. It's the transitionary time, you know? Millennial time of the end of the imperial China and the birth of republican government. Remember, remember, I told you? He, uh, I can't remember, he died in 1936. And Pao Kun steered the artistic rudder through the turbulence of the early days of nationalism, following Singapore's attainment of independence in 1965. So both, in other words, in, in fin de sequel eras. Now, this is the, the time in, uh, it actually, it was the May 4th, 1919 uh, picture from there. China at the turn of the 20th century was on its knees. The insular concept of the Middle Kingdom, you know, Zhongguo, you know, huh? they really had this idea that they were in the middle, and anybody who's further and further and further and further away came, more barbarian, more barbarian, more barbarian, more barbarian, more barbarian, more barbarian. You, you know that? I mean, they really believed it. So they didn't learn from the Industrial Revolution which was happening in the West. Yeah, it started with the steam engines and all that sort of strange things, right? And have all that. So they never knew anything about the Industrial Revolution. The British came to China, helped themselves to Canton, Hong Kong, yeah? Germans came along, helped themselves to the Shantong Peninsula, and then taught the Chinese how to make beer. You know Qingdao beer? Uh. And the Japanese came along, and they, among other things later, did occupied Manchuria, correct? So people were coming and then helping themselves to bits and bobs of the country. 
And if you talk about China, China's humiliation, if you read, you will really understand them. So Japan was on the side of the Allies in the First World War. Second World War, enemy, right? So when they were going to sign the Treaty of Versailles, which was going to happily cut off bits and bombs, take the, the land, that the, 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 the colonial land that Germans occupied and give back, give back, give back, give back, give back. They had, the Germans had Shantung Peninsula, right? And instead of giving the Chinese back the Shantung Peninsula, because there was Chinese land, they gave it to the Japanese. They couldn't take it. They meaning the people of China who had awoken by that time. And the students of the Peking University went out into the streets and said, this was it. We're not going to take this kind of humiliation. You take back the Shantung Peninsula and you give it to the Japanese. We all, this is our land. Okay, so about 3,000 students came out and protested. 